Welcome to Calming the ADHD Family, a summit on brain hacks for a calm, confident, connected family. My name is Laura Dawn and I am your host. I am an ADHD warrior mama to two amazing neurodiverse boys and the founder of the ADHD Village. Let's talk about video games. Hands up if your child or teen spends too much time gaming. Does this sound familiar? You tell your child that dinner is in 10 minutes. They will need to stop playing and get ready to eat with the family. 10 minutes goes by, your child is still gaming. You tell them it's time now and they refuse. They yell at you to leave them alone. They are in an important game which cannot pause. You're left not knowing what the right thing is to do. Do you show them compassion and wait for the game to be over? Do you cut the Wi-Fi? Do you set up a plan to prevent this from happening again and again and again? <laughs> In this interview, we will learn why video games are addictive, how to know when it is time for the adults to take control, and how to pull them away from their screens. And get ready, because our amazing speaker, Aaron, is going to be teaching us how we can actually use video games to improve our parenting. So this is a very hot topic and it's, uh, I have got my, one of my favorite ADHD experts in the world and a member of the ADHD village, Erin Huey. Erin is the founder of Parenting Teens That Struggle and the host of the number one parenting podcast, Beyond Risk and Back, which is a mental health news radio uh, network's highest rated show internationally. He is also a family consultant, a teen coach, and an addiction interventionist. Welcome, Aaron. Yay! Hi, Laura. <laughs> I'm so honored that you're taking the time to share your expertise around parenting and gaming with us. Well, I, I have to say I love being part of the ADHD Village because in my medieval fantasy mind nobody could conquer an adhd village nobody <laughs> we would hear you coming a million miles away we would have all our weapons with us already and we would be charging out the battlefield before you ever got your tent set up so i am safe in my adhd village so thank you for creating my safe village laura oh, i love it and when you say we, you have adhd <laughs> yourself and i can tell by your your wiggling and your moving yeah. I, I, yeah, I am always standing up when I do my shows, when I do interviews, I rock, I talk, the voice inside my head is way louder than your voice, Laura. So I will try to listen to you, but most likely I'm hearing what's going on in my head. I'm a very ADHD adult. Uh, and I thank my lucky stars for finding an unbelievably patient, understanding, amazing wife, um, who not only can, uh, be compassionate, but also call me out on it. And uh, I was diagnosed with ADHD in the early 70s, uh, when it was still being this thing that we were like, hey, we think if you give them Ritalin, it starts connecting those synopses. And if that doesn't work, add some caffeine. So to this day, I remain an absolute coffee junkie, caffeine addict. Uh, I am an addict in recovery, 23 years uh, from cannabis, LSD, and alcohol. Uh, the experience of being ADHD, I embrace. It is my superpower, and I will, I will remain me. And what I can say to parents right here at the beginning, if I can say one sentence that describes what it's like to be ADHD, it's very simply this. I'm not you. I have no, I can, I can give you all these things that I can apologize for and, and tell you that I do and tell you what it's like inside this flamenco dancing, heavy metal <laughs> scream therapy brain that I have, but you won't understand it. So all I can say is stop thinking that I should be thinking like you. I don't, I won't, I can't, I shan't, and it ain't going to happen. And you can medicate me to numbness. But if you don't want me on that medication forever and you take me off, my brain's going to go back to its programming. Well, you said ADHD is your superpower. And I know a lot of people embrace that idea, but I also know parents who are at the beginning of this ADHD journey with their child and they're overwhelmed. Oh my gosh. So 
<laughs> how do we get from this overwhelm and dealing with meltdowns and hyperactiveness and impulsivity and disorganization and huge emotional outbursts? How do we get from, from that to the superpower? That is such a powerful question because first of all, that's asking people who can't understand my neurodivergence to be compassionate. And that is in and of itself its own learning process and takes time. And in all the years that I've worked with teens and parents, and, and I need parents to understand, I ran a residential treatment center uh, for adolescents age 12 to 17 and a school for adolescents age 12 to 17, so middle and high. And so working with kids, neurodivergent on all different kinds of spectrums, um, you have to develop the compassion. You have to develop the skills. The worst thing we can do is expect everybody to change so that we can be happy. We call that the stage five of the lizard brain, right? The if then, if only my child would stop having meltdowns, be able to focus, hold still, uh, focus for crap's sake, focus. Are you even listening to me? Do you even know I'm in the room with you? Do you remember what we just talked about? No, I don't. But the moment you believe that if I change, you will be happy. You have not only put me in charge of your happiness, and I may be a three-year-old child or a 30-year-old ADHD adult, but you have put a pressure on me that I am unwilling to take because I'm capable of it. And I will tell you, one of my superpowers is uh, my hypervigilancy. I see everything that's going on. You think your kid doesn't know that you're frustrated? They have seen it. They know it. They've processed it. They've moved on to the next moment. And there were only so many of so many moments of me having to make sure that I'm aware of how everybody in the room individually is being affected by this moment where I am so passionate and excited that now I'm talking really loud and I want you to understand. And somebody goes, Hey, Aaron, could you calm down? And not only does that stifle my passion, my expression, but now my brain has spun out onto you don't like me for who I am and to be liked, I have to change. And when you spend your childhood constantly evaluating your environment so that you can fit in, you develop hypervigilance. I can read micro expressions and body language. I teach therapists body language and micro expressions. I do body language, you know, fun demonstrations in Vegas. Like this is, I, I'm good because I can see it happening while I'm talking to you, focusing on the bird that just flew by the window and the guy in the back that has an orange suit coat that reminds me of Captain Kangaroo. And when I was a kid, <laughs> Captain Kangaroo, and wait, what were we talking about? Because now I'm talking about Captain, and that's my life. I'm not going to be in your moments with you because that was 15 moments ago. You're slow. I'm fast. Stop asking me to slow down. But that's asking a ton for a parent who's got other kids, for a parent who's trying to pay their mortgage, for a parent who's going through frustrations in their own marriage, in their own life, they have their own issues to deal with. Now they got to do this with their kid. Yes, you do. And there's a learning curve and there's moments of grace and there's moments of true understanding, but there's a lot more moments, ask my mom, of going to just hide in the corner and cry for a second, catch your breath because you got to call me to dinner and I'm playing a video game. Let's get into that video game topic <laughs> because this is a hot topic. It really is. It really, there's so many parents. I just want to read you a message because this is the kind of message I see quite often. Yeah. Um, how I'm desperate. My teen is addicted to gaming and his phone. He'd be happy to never spend time with his family and just stay glued to his technology. What can I do? Yeah. So I have a book about to come out called Parenting's, Parenting Teens That Struggle with Tech Addiction. And ADHD uh, doubles down on the tech addiction. So when we are talking about video games, when we are talking about the technology dependency issues, first of all, 
recognize this, that the research is starting to catch up, catch up with the issue. So there is more for you to learn online. Go learn it. Number two, as they are researching these problems that parents are crying help for, they are realizing, and by they, I mean the researchers, the psychiatrists, the psychologists, and the psychoanalysts are looking at the brain chemistry, the brain function while the child is playing video games, and they're realizing that it is not as damaging as we thought. Mm. It is frustrating, it is distracting, and it is not the direction we want our kids on. The There are very very scary things. And, and um, there was a military uh, psychiatrist, uh, uh, David Grossman, Lieutenant David Grossman, who wrote a book, Stop Training Your Kids to Kill. And he is adamantly against violent video games. Now, he was part of the research team that started to look at video game effects on the brain. Now he started with adult brains, men and women in our military and our armed forces. Thank you for your service. The, uh, what he came out with was terrifying. The more we learn about it and start to understand what is addictive and the difference between the addiction point and why children are so attracted and connected to it. That's not addiction. That's attraction and connection. Addiction means I keep doing this and it's screwing up my life and I can't stop. Not I won't stop. I can't stop. You take your kid's video game controller away from them. They scream. They call you names and words you didn't know. They knew they kick a hole in the wall and you go, should I be concerned? And my response is if you had just taken their pills or their bong away and they did that same behavior. Mm -hmm. Would you be concerned? And of course the answer is yes. So then be concerned. But now let's figure out what is actually going on. Why? Why? First of all, without the foundation, no tool, technique, tactic, or trick will work to not understand what is taking place. First and foremost, a basic human need is being met by the video game in a fast easy way. That's the bird brain of human nature. Our brain is going to default to something that's easy and quick. We all do it. Well, I've had such a hard day at work. I'm going to come home, drink five glasses of wine and binge watch the new Netflix series. And, you know, three hours later, Netflix goes, uh, are you still watching or did you leave the TV on? Right. That's your cycle to release, let go. And it's your bird brain. So your child's bird brain is doing the same thing with the video games. This is an easy way to get one of five human needs met. Safety, power, connection, freedom, or worth. Safety, power, connection, freedom, or worth. Those are developmentally in order. Safety starts in utero. Worth is something we go through in our 30s. But we have all those needs, safety, power, connection, freedom, and worth at all times in our life. If safety doesn't develop, then freedom is going to struggle. Worth is going to struggle. Connection is going to struggle, right? If connection doesn't develop, we will reconsider our safety concept. They're all interlaced. And a video game stimulates the brain in such a way that the child thinks that these needs are being met. Now, here's what David Grossman, Dr. Lieutenant David Grossman, realized in his research. He was looking at military personnel, men and women, who were out in the Middle East conflict in live firefights with uh, um, the, the, the electrodes on their brain, measuring brain activity in which parts of the brain are stimulated during live combat. Then these people would come back and they would sit down to relax playing first person shooter games with the electrodes on. You know what I'm going to say next? The exact same parts of the brain are being stimulated. The brain could not tell the difference between being actually shot at or playing a video game where that was happening. The body was not involved in the latter. Trauma takes place when something happens to the body that the brain doesn't reconcile or something happens to the brain that the body doesn't reconcile, right? Tearing a muscle is something that is not reconciling in the body. It is not working. There is a dysfunction. And so you need to use a therapeutic process to recover function. 
they took that information about brain stimulation and the Olympic committee picked up on it. And they said, well, wait a second, can we take it even farther? And they had people run and win races, measuring what parts of the brain were being stimulated, and then sit down and imagine that they were running and winning races. Same parts of the brain are stimulated. So it is not accurate for us to say that our children are doing nothing when they're playing video games. Their brains are fully stimulated and firing like crazy. And when you look at the different kinds of video games, uh, there are some video games where you are building whole cities and defending them from marauders. You are stimulating someone's creativity. You're stimulating someone's action. If they're playing racing games, their, their, their flinch muscles and their, their eye hand coordination is being stimulated. There is a massive stimulation taking place. The addictive part we haven't even touched addiction yet, is called the random reward generator. The random reward generator is when your kid is walking through their video game, and they may have walked through this part before, or they may have it, but suddenly there's a loot box, there's a <laughs> treasure chest, and they open it, and oh, there's that weapon they wanted, there's that healing potion they needed, there's that whatever, the random algorithm generates into the box. That's the addictive principle. Is that enough to create video game addicts? No. It, it, that, that, that does stimulate the same part of the brain that gamblers are working with when they are addicted to gambling, that random reward. So that leaves us to understand that video games and video game dependency means that they are dependent on other aspects of the video game. This is where the dialogue or the narrative around video games and parenting begins to shift because these other things, this is hard to hear, are not bad. I have a, a, a six-year-old nephew who I was talking to the other day, and he's very much involved in a video game. And we were out at the beach, so he wasn't allowed to play it. And you would hear him start the whining to his mom. His mom has listened to not only yours and my stuff, Laura, uh, that we've done together, but she listened to me talking to video game addiction experts. And she kind of shoots me this look. And I looked at the kid and I said, you know, the, the video game isn't the problem. How you act when you don't get the video game is the problem. So that's what I'm actually dealing with. Now, saying that in the moment when your kid's screaming at you and kicking a <laughs> hole in the wall, it's not going to work. So this is where we transition from the addiction point and the brain stimulation point, the, the short science, the short scientific lesson behind video games into, okay, so this thing is addictive. Okay, this thing is stimulating their brain, but their body's not active. And okay, I get it. They're depending on the video game for need, uh, for, for meeting human needs. So like, it's still a miserable battle in my home. And that's where we say, okay, here's where we begin to shift the conversation. Where does it shift to? I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> and that is my dramatic side holding for pause. So the audience leans forwards. And then I say, we'll be right back after this. No, I'm so, <laughs> so this is, this is the tactic of working with a child who's dealing with the video game struggle. Number one, this conversation that we're about to model has to happen when things are going good, not bad. Things are going good, like you're on the way home from school and you decide today's a good day. We're going to do it. I feel good. I got a lot of sleep last night. I got my exercise gym time in today. I've eaten a healthy meal. I had a salad for lunch, been drinking enough water, and I've been moving my body. Parents, you have to understand that a good day means that you have fulfilled your basic five points of foundation for your own personal health and well-being. OK, whether your child is ADHD on the autism spectrum, addicted to video games or smoking cannabis all day long or has been suicidal or is self-harming, 
Nothing can be accomplished if you are not taking care of yourself. Now, that is a tall order when your family's in crisis. So let's bring it back to the five basics. Sleep, nutritional food, drinking enough water, moving your body, and breathing on purpose. Everybody can do those. Sleep is the tough one. When you are really stressed and scared, especially you moms, because men and the masculine brain still has this ability to compartmentalize. Um, I have a very feminine brain. It, it's, a, it's a very, I, and I spin, and I spin all night. And I, what, here's one thing you need to know about your ADHD child. They don't sleep well. When they wake up, they're up. Their brain, like it's like... And it is full tilt <laughs> the moment I wake up. So the sleep bit is hard, but sleep management, drinking enough water, nutritionist, nutritional, nutritionist, healthy food, <laughs> moving your body and breathing on purpose. You see, if you don't do those five things, you die. If you don't sleep, if you don't eat, if you don't drink water, if you don't move your body, and if you don't breathe, you die. Now, no one will accidentally be a good parent. No one will accidentally <laughs> suddenly change the paradigm of a home in crisis. No one will accidentally say the right thing and their kid goes, you know what, mom? You're right. This video game thing is getting out of hand. I am going to manage my time better. Not going to happen. You want your home back? You got to take your home back. But your Best parenting when you're exhausted, when you're furious, when you haven't moved your body or eaten healthy food or drank water and you're barely breathing, your best parenting sucks. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> but your worst parenting when your personal management system is in play is better. It's, it's better than, than that other stuff. And it can improve and grow from there. Aaron, I'm so glad you brought this up. It's so fascinating to me. I've done about half of my interviews for the summit so far. And this topic of self-care has come up in one way or another in nearly every single conversation. Yeah. I have to, I have to give this one to my parents. My parents did amazing with my ADHD. And I don't know if you can tell, but I am a tad bit ADHD. I am a little <laughs> high energy. But my but and as as I was, I am extremely high energy. And I always have been. I am God's caffeine buzz. I am <laughs> I am linked to divine expression of energy. And my parents did amazing with it. And one of the things both my parents did was look at me and say, he probably won't die today. I'm going to the gym. <laughs> and they took care of themselves. My mom did things she loved. My dad did things he loved. And they handled me. They made sure I had, this is where we're making the transition. So grab your notepads, folks. <laughs> Controlled map access in video games. And what I have done, I'm going to say about 75% of my clients, all, all of whom are boys, not all my clients, but the 75% who are all boys are my clients because of their video game struggles. So this is something I am very near and dear to. I interviewed all of them. Why do you love video games? And I have a list of 30 reasons why they love the video game. One thing on the list is addictive. One thing. We all know what it is. Random reward generator. But the first thing they all said is, I really like the way I can't go outside a certain area until I've earned the right. You know what that's called, parents? Boundaries. They love boundaries. The reason why they're successful in the game is because there are boundaries. Now, you've picked up the kid at school. Things are going well. You're going to take them out for ice cream and you're going to say things have been going really well. And so I want to talk about something that makes things not go well. And of course, you know, kiddo, it's the video games thing. I'm going to make some changes around how I parent. I've realized that I'm parenting you and the video game thing wrong. I'm, I'm the adult and I'm I'm finding myself in power struggles with you. And so I'm going to change how I'm parenting you around video games. Now, it probably will affect you, but try not to worry about it. 
Now, here's what I just did, parents. I did a process called front loading, damaging admission, and neuro linguistic programming. I did three things. I had this conversation before I ever made a change. I told the kid the change was coming. And I left that open so that the kid can ask questions about the change. Number two, I made a damaging admission. This is a tactic that lawyers and commercials use. Lawyers say things like, Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my client has a checkered past. They have a very thick police file and they have stolen things from people. They have committed carjackings. Uh, my client has robbed an old woman of her purse at gunpoint. But ladies and gentlemen of the jury, your honor, my client is not a murderer. Now, what I did is I answered the big question in the room by saying, by giving the damaging admission, by announcing what I've done wrong. I haven't been parenting you well around the video games, and I've been creating power struggles between us. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that anymore. See, I'm putting myself under contract. I'm not expecting my child, let me say that word again, child, to change their behavior to make the house peaceful. I'm going to make the house peaceful. And by doing so, my child will have to change their behavior to conform to the social construct that I am in creation of. No child is responsible for a peaceful system. They are recipients. The trickle down of the peaceful household will benefit my child. So I'm going to take full responsibility for the environment and release them of the responsibility. I know that sounds counterproductive, but I promise you, in 20 years of doing this work, in running a facility, the best way to connect to a teenager, a child who's ready to battle you the moment you say, turn it off, is to say, I'm not doing well when I tell you to turn it off. I'm coming to this with a lot of anger, energy, resentment. I have all these emotions built up. I think about it at night. And then I say three words, turn it off. And it's filled with negative, psychic, dark, shadowy, lightning bolt energy aimed at you. And I am sorry. I love you. And I am putting a lot of negativity in this. So I'm going to make some changes. Changes may affect you. Try not to worry about it. Now, that third tactic is try not to worry about it. <laughs> guess what my kid's going to do? They're going to worry about it. <laughs> I have commanded their brain to consider that things are changing. Now I'm walking them through the process of change, right? Contemplation, pre-contemplation, change, and then maintenance. So I am walking them through. I'm contemplating a change. Hey, we're going to change this. The change begins Thursday. Today's Thursday. The change begins, and then we do maintenance on the change. What does the change have to look like? Well, this is where that first strategy, controlled map access. All of our changes we're going to make about video games are going to contain video game components. Because if the children are responding to how the video game is talking to them, speaking to them, commanding them to pay attention and play and focus and solve problems and don't quit, can we use those strategies? And the answer is, yep, we absolutely can. So controlled map access, boundaries. You may play video games. Let me change how I just said that. I am willing to provide internet for video games between the hours of blank and blank. Very clear boundary. Now, this boundary is based on my willingness, not my child's behavior. I am willing to increase those hours should I see A, B, or C. I am willing to decrease these hours if I see any lying, stealing, sneaking, cheating, or breaking the law. Now, those are five non-negotiables. Lying, stealing, sneaking, cheating, breaking the law. Now, you can add yelling. But damn it, parents, if you don't want your children to yell at you, you best not be yelling at them. 
you know what? I, I, did a, I did a podcast with a guy who talked about having a heart attack and his daughter um, saw him to the hospital. And as his daughter was walking out of the room, the daughter said, dad, give me your phone so that you don't lose it. And the dad handed her his phone and they put the anesthesia on. And his last memory before he went under was, that's the first time I am not afraid of my daughter seeing my download history. And then he went unconscious because he was a porn addict and he would have never allowed his kids to look at his history. So if we're going to hold these expectations of personal management around electronics, then damn it, you best be modeling at that because there is nothing in anything you will hear from any teacher, coach, instructor, therapist, counselor, professor, guru that is going to change how what your child does. What will change what your child does is what you model, period, end of statement. Argue with me all you want, but my only response will be, tell me one lecture <laughs> your parents gave you when you were a child that changed your life. One lecture. Tell me what they said. Now, I bet if you and I talked about who you are based on what your parents did or did not do, we could talk all day long. So this is what's important about this contract, this family behavior contract around video games. This is not a new set of rules for the child. This is a new set of rules for the family. Mm -hmm. I am willing, willingness is based on our value system not on children's good or bad behavior. Children will lack bad, make risky decisions, blah, blah, blah. They're children. It's how they learn. Adults should be acting based on values. We're adults. Our prefrontal cortex is fully developed. Theirs is not. When you take away someone's ability to get their needs met, they will go into survival mode. When you're doing it with their video games, they will fight, flight, freeze, faint, fornicate, feed. Those are the six things that a lizard does. The li limbic brain is the same as a lizard brain. It is a survival brain. So when we say, here are the changes that I'm going to make. I am willing. Let's talk about what we're willing to do first. I am willing to provide internet access for video games for this many hours per day and this many hours on the weekend. I'm willing to increase that if I see A, B, C, and D behaviors. I am willing to decrease it if I see lying, stealing, sneaking, cheating, breaking the law. That's controlled map access. I will release this hallway to more video game time when you complete the side mission. What's the side mission? Extra chores, helping dad in the garage, helping mom fix the car, helping dad cook dinner, helping older brother rake the leaves. I don't care. Parents, I don't care what you do. I care how you do it. That's the self-regulated, well-balanced, healthy, I took care of myself today, mom and dad. Whatever comes out, do I take the phone? Do I shut off the internet? I don't care. How did you shut off the internet? God damn it. I've had enough of you, Laura. This is, I'm sick and tired. Give me this. I'm taking, no, no, you're done. You're done. Nah, don't forget about it. They're not going to focus on their strategy. They're going to focus on your emotion. And see, that's what video games do. They get your kid focused on their strategies. That's number two. First is controlled map access. Number two is focus your child on their strategy. Don't lecture them about it. They learn nothing. See, video games have this brilliant way of letting your child fail forward. So this is the failing forward concept. Your child employs a strategy when they hit a new level. They go right. Right? They respawn and they go right. They respawn and they go right. Every time they go right, their avatar gets killed and they respawn. So they go left. That's what we want our children to do in life. So you controlling the map access, if you control it with emotions, watch. Your child will come up with an emotions that will out emotion even the most emotional parent <laughs> until all you're left with is violence. Right? And that's disconnect. So, you know, I've seen emotional adults. Have you ever seen an emotional teenager? Good Lord Almighty. 
They can, they can outdo adults. So you've got to be able to control the map and get them to focus on their strategy without emotion. Of course, you're going to have emotion. Just don't use it as a consequence. Call up Laura and say, Laura, I'm ready to strangle my seven-year-old. And Laura's going to go, oh, my God, I feel you. Jeez. One time, my kid, like, me too, and blah, blah, blah. And then 15 minutes later, we're going to go, oh, God, thank you. I needed that. Okay, so what do I do, Laura? And Laura's going to go, okay, let's talk through this. Did you go for a walk today? And we start at the basics. That's how adults handle emotions. Children go from feel to action, feeling to action. There's no gap. Adults, you have to have the gap. It is literally the thing that defines you as an adult, the gap between what you feel and what you do. So they, they've come to this point and the strategy is failing them. There's nothing you can say that's going to change it. They have to experience the feelings that come with failure. They do in video games all the time. God damn it, this game. I can't, uh, uh, and then they get respawned and they start over and they try again. Failing forward strategy means your kid's going to fail their way to success. Uh, anybody raise your hand if you think that's how life works. Ooh. We've all <laughs> failed our way to, to our successes. That's how it works. Video games are employing that concept. So expect your child to fail their way through this. Now, the other thing that came up with this strategy and failing your way is that respawn point. When a child does make a mistake and you have to start them over based on the contract. Oh, I'm, I'm I know this is such a bummer. I know it, it, this sucks. I know it sucks, but I do know that you snuck the video game last night after I went to bed and I'm, I'm sorry that you're really struggling with this, but as per our contract, we will be going back to one hour a day. I'm sorry. You're struggling with this. It's my context. It's how I said what I said that matters. Oh, I know. I know you're struggling with this. I'm sorry, but we're going back to one hour a day. Right. I said the exact same words. It's how I said it that mattered. So letting your child respawn at a reasonable place. You see, when your child is working in the video games, moving their way through a video game, if they're at level six and their avatar gets killed, they do not go back to the beginning. They go back to the beginning of level six. And the rewards, incentives, and powers and equipment that they had at the beginning of level six, they get those again. They don't get stripped of all rights and privileges. That, that doesn't work. Because what that does for a child's brain is create an ambiguity. While the video game is giving your child very clear step by step, here is how you level one, then level two, then level three, then level four. In the same way where you say, when you're 12, you can stay up till 930. When you're 14, you can stay up till 10. When you're 15, you can stay up till 1030. And so on, because it's a privilege earned through by proxy of growing up, video games have done that too. So clear definition of how to move forward. That helps. And when they are moving forward and they do screw it up because they will, they don't go back to the beginning. They go back to a respawn point. So you don't set their curfew back to noon. You set it back to whatever they had the last time they earned that level up. Show them how, they, how to level up in the family behavior contract. Don't keep it a secret. Well, mom, when do I get to earn it back? Mom, 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 when do I get it back? Mom, no, mom, mom, tell me, right? You, we've all had that one. <laughs> tell them. We'll talk about this on Thursday. And if things go good between now and Thursday, I will be willing, value system, I will be willing to have the conversation about you playing video games starting Friday. If there's any lying, stealing, sneaking, or cheating, or breaking the law between now and Thursday, I will, we will talk on Sunday. So see, now I'm, I'm defining the map again, right? Clear map access. I'm telling them what's going to happen. No child, when I trust you, that's when you get your video games back. When I, tr when I feel like, no, because that's actually not a feeling. Right. Feelings are I'm sad. I'm angry. I'm happy. I'm scared. 
Those are feelings. I feel like you're lying to me. That's a thought. So parents, if, <laughs> to, to, to teach emotional intelligence, you have to actually be able to communicate emotions. Well, I think that you're just making up excuses. That's thinking. So that's correct. I feel frustrated because we had an agreement and I'm thinking that you don't take our agreement seriously. That is emotional intelligence being communicated. Oh, I feel like you're just playing me. And I, I feel like nothing matters. Those aren't feelings. Those are thoughts, right? So be very clear because video games are really clear, super clear. Now, remember, parents, everything I'm telling you are things that the kids told me as to why they like the video game. Well, it's clear. I understand what I'm supposed to do. I know what I have to do next. I know what I'm looking for. I know that I got to battle the big boss to get to the next level. Video games don't drop the bar. They don't make the game easier if your kid keeps failing at their strategy. If they've set the bar here and the kid keeps failing because they got a dumb strategy, hold that bar there. Is there anything else you can think of how to do this? No, I've tried everything. Of course they haven't. Nobody has. See, I'm willing to give you some input if you're open to listening to it. Now you can talk about your ideas. But see, otherwise the video game says, good luck. You'll get it. I believe you. You can finish this game. That is why children understand who they are in the video game and not in your home. And I, I want to say this so powerfully, self-esteem and self-worth are irrelevant to me. I don't, I don't entertain those concepts when I hear people, parents, coaches, teachers, therapists talk about it. Well, oh, this child has low self-esteem. No, they don't. They have low self-concept. Laura, if I tell you, and for, for, for parents of ADHD kids, I, I really want you to understand this. If I say to you, there's a McLaren in the garage of my condo. Laura, do you know what I'm talking about? Good, you don't. <laughs> that McLaren costs $650,000. So Laura, do you understand the value that I have established now? I understand it costs a lot of money, but I have no clue what it is. <laughs> exactly. So how does that amount of money mean anything? If I then say, oh, McLarens are cars, okay. and then you look them up, and then you're like, holy crap, this looked like it was carved by a Buddhist monk in a cave. Like, it is unbelievable. It is like a driving sand mandala. Look, I have no idea uh, why a McLaren is $650,000. I could give a crap. But what I understand is, if I know what it is, if I have a concept of it, then I can understand the perceived value. So to tell me that your child has low self-worth, low mm -hmm. self-esteem, I'm going to say, okay, what's, what is your child's self-concept? And you're going to go, what? Mm -hmm. Your child doesn't have low self-esteem. They have no self-concept. But in the video game, I had a client who was 16 years old. <clears throat> It was up to 18 hours a day playing video games. Yeah. Stopped going to school. Brilliant kid. Beautiful kid. All his beauty and brilliance is starting to fade. His skin is starting to suffer. His health is starting to suffer. Hasn't been to school in six months. Mom's a therapist. And the kid is just like, you know, I'm, he just plays all day, all night, sleeps a few hours, eats whatever junk he can get his hands on. I know a lot of parents understand what I'm saying here. And the mom is sitting in session with me and says, I don't understand this. He's smart. He's good looking. He's athletic. He's strong. Why this? And I said, what game do you play? And he goes, EverQuest. I happen to understand EverQuest as a concept. EverQuest is one of those games where you have magic, you have swords, you have powers and muscles, you have strength, dexterity, charisma, constitution, and wisdom. You work with a team of people online to go around, complete missions, save the princess, save the village, battle the dragon, on and on and on. 
and he's telling me about it. And you see him light up when he talks about the sword that he owns or how much money his avatar has and how many friends he has online and how they work as a team and the problems that they solved and that there was another group in Australia who was battling them and they beat them because they worked together and on and on and on. And I said, well, how's life at school? And he goes, oh, I get bullied. And I said, well, how's life at home? And he goes, well, I mean, all this started when my dad shot himself in front of me when I was five years old. And right before he put the gun into the mouth, he said, I'm doing this because of you. And then blew his brains out. And so I looked at the mom and I said, so in reality, he's bullied and has no father who's blamed him for his suicide at five years old. And in the video game world, which remember stimulates the same part of the brain as reality. He has power. He has friends. He has a purpose. He has a concept. He knows who he is there. Here in this world, he doesn't. In that world, he's a fucking superhero. So tell me which one you would choose. Look at your child being attracted to this experience where they are completely and totally in control of their destiny. And then ask them why they're choosing it. You totally get this now. So to, to, to pull them out of that, to get them to focus on you when this thing has their joy, you've got to find a way to replace that joy. And it's not easy. Oh my God, at the beach, getting my nephew, it was like, here's right, this mask and we found starfish. And he and I sat for hours talking about superheroes because I'm a total superhero nerd. And I know everything about every superhero. And he was asked question after question. Then it starts into Viking mythology. It just so happens, Aaron's a total geek about Viking mythology and pirates and ninjas. And so- but then the, the learning and the experiences, we were walking and talking and making sandcastles together and coming up with scenarios. You got you to gotta replace it. And the world isn't designed to replace an ADHD kid's thought process or a video game's excitement and level of achievement. So it's no easy thing to say. And it's, it's not beneficial to say, this is bad. This is a device that's teaching them boundaries problem solving, trying again, and focusing on their own strategy. This is teaching them teamwork. I have sat with my clients playing video games and listened to them talk to each other online. You know what they talk about? Everything. They talk about girls. They talk about their sweater. My mom got me the sweatshirt. I think it's stupid. No, dude, it looks really good on you. Oh, yeah, thanks. Okay, well, I'll give it another shot. Hey, man, do you like those new Nikes? I totally don't. Hey, the Chargers won last night. Yeah, I know. I, I totally, I was totally rooting for the Bills. Like, they talk about everything. They're not disconnected. They're connected. Their brain is stimulated. They're building and creating and winning and growing, and their bodies are suffering. And that's the fear. The fear is they're doing none of that. And that's not true. But to change the paradigm of the home, first, you have to understand where you're coming from. And if it's not a healthy place, get healthy before you confront this one, because this will be a battle. Number two, use the video game strategies themselves. And there's a lot of them. Sit with your kid. Watch them play and ask them what they're doing. Find the symbolism in it. Why does that matter? What was that thing you just picked up? Oh, that's the blue diamond of excellency. What does that do? Well, that gives me the power to fight the zombies. If you don't have it, what does it do? Listen to their thought process. Listen to how much they know. This will translate in the future. That's even though such a nice way. Sorry to interrupt you. That is such a nice way to build connection with your kids because- when they are leading the interest or the play or whatever, and you're a part of their world, that is when connection happens on a, like a limbic level. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if they are passionate about video games, they are going to love for you to sit with them and watch them play and ask them questions and learn about it. And then you'll have an understanding of why they're so passionate, why they're wanting to play these video games all, all the time. And it comes back to what you said at the very beginning. We want to understand why, why are they into these video games? Yeah. 
I'm glad you interrupted me because I just looked down and like, holy crap, Aaron, you've been talking for 40 minutes straight. Like, do you even <laughs> breathe in there? Um, that's the only way for anybody to get a word in edgewise is to interrupt me. So if there's anything else, please do interrupt me. But I do want to say to the question, do I just shut it off? Do I just shut off the internet? Or do I take that PS 15 that cost them six years of allowance and throw it off the balcony of our third story bedroom porch? If you want, just make sure they know that that's what's going to happen when things are going uh, you, you gotta, you've got to front load that this will be your strategy if this thing gets in the way of school. So it's not just the parents having an emotional reaction to what's oh. going on and just, oh, I've had it and this is gone now. The moment your emotions become the consequence, they will not focus on their strategy. Like, I'm so angry I break your phone. Then you're just an a-hole who broke my phone. But if you say, ah, oh, I'm so sorry. I know this is hard. I know how important these games are to you. I really do. I understand. And I told you what I was willing to do. Now I'm going to go ahead and act a consequence. I'm going to walk into the other room and unplug the internet. Now that will shut off the game. I haven't saved. I know. And what did I say? Right. That's the controlled map. Stop to be logical to a child. When they say, but I'm not safe. save point is really, really important. And, and it, it's one of the strategies and I parents how to utilize the save point. But you've got to tell your kids dinner's in 15. And if you don't hit the save point by 15 minutes, the video game will go off anyway. So I hope you find your save point because ultimately you are going, and you will tell them, you will front load this. You're going to stop reminding them. Because if you want your child to manage and multitask, then they've got to be able to be focused and watch that clock. Why? Because that's how life works. I will say, I, I have a, my, my son is 25 years old, loves video games, always has. Um, but I did not have this direct struggle with my own child. I had other struggles with my son and other struggles with my daughter, who's 26. But my son managed his video games. And, and I want to tell parents, this is a, my wife and I decided to end the homework battle when our children were in middle school. We sat them down over spaghetti, chili, or burritos, because I think that's all my wife ever cooked. My wife and I ever cooked our children, because we were both not that good cooks. Um, but we sat down when things are going good. And we said, hey, good, good news, great news. Um, we're not going to ask about your homework anymore. We're not going to ask about your grades and we're not going to go online and check your grades. It's all up to you. It's your work. We're not going to have the homework conversations or homework battles. Anything the kids will. Is it just where we're having battles instead of sitting down out? How was your day? It's becoming about school and school is important, but it's not more important than us as a family. So we're going to focus on that during dinner. And the kids were like, okay, fine. And we would know a math test is coming. My son loved video games. He was good. And I bought him two video games a year. He bought all of his other ones. I bought him his favorites for his birthday and for the holidays. And he would be obsessed for about six to eight weeks, depending on the complexity of the game. And then he would go, okay, I'm done. And he'd go out and skateboard. And he would, and I remember times where there was this test looming. And we knew, and at dinner, he'd be like, yeah, I got to study for a test after dinner. And I'd be like, hey, do you need any support? No, I got it. And he'd help clear the dishes because dinner is not just sitting and talking. Dinner is cooking and dishes. Everybody is involved. And then, so he helped with dinner. And then he goes upstairs and you hear the video game. Come on. And my wife and I are like, oh, don't say anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> He's got to study. No, nope, we said we weren't. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. Nine o'clock, still playing video games. And I go out and the only thing I say to him is, hey, bud, turn it down. I'm going to bed. Oh, my wife and I just held each other from jumping out of the bed going, <laughs> you got to study. What about math? Your life? Come on. And the next day we knew what was going to happen. He came home from school. How'd you do on the math test? I failed. And we're like, no, duh. Of course you fit. No, of course we didn't say that. We know he, we knew he was not going to pass it. We knew, but we didn't, we held it. 
oh, that sucks. What's your plan? Because see, ultimately, what my wife and I did right, what my mom and dad did right for me, is communicated that they'll trust me to figure it out. See, if you don't hand the problem to the child, and you constantly try to solve your children's problems, when your solutions don't work, your children blame you. But my parents were really good at looking me and going, no, you broke it, you fix it. And we did that with our children. So when my son said, no, I failed my test, we said, oh, bummer. What's your plan? He goes, oh, I've already talked to my teacher. I get a retake tomorrow. Highest grade I can get is a B, but I'll be able to pass it. And that night he studied. And you know what? My son has two degrees, one in international business and one in sound engineering and design and plays video games all the damn time and is in a band and works at a music studio in Mexico where he lives. They figure it out. If you give the problem back to them to figure it out, if this becomes an emotional struggle with you, then that's what they will try to navigate. And then in response, they will do what you've modeled and they will give you their emotional struggle to navigate. And none of it will focus on the strategy. But to say, hey, I know it's video game time. This is your one and only one reminder. Internet plug gets pulled at five o'clock. Make sure you watch the clock, dude. I love you. And that's all you say, unless you want to say one more thing. Hey, 15 minutes till plug pull. But when it's time to pull that plug, when it's time to shut off the internet, when it's time to disconnect their phone, do it. Don't hem, don't haw, don't dance, don't give another warning. Stop it. Stop talking and go pull the plug mm -hmm. and they'll scream and cry. And you'll go, I know this is frustrating. I'm sorry. This is hard. My friends, parents don't. Blah, 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 blah. And you go, I know. I'm sorry. That's so sad. Keep it simple. Be really empathetic for what they're going through because you are taking away a need fulfillment device. Is it maladaptive? Sure can be. Is it a cheap coping strategy? Oh, yeah. But here's the last thing I'm going to say, and then I promise I will stop talking, <laughs> which is a total lie. <laughs> here's what I'm going to say. Adults design video games. Adults develop video games. Adults produce video games. Adults market video games. And adults sell video games to adults who give them to their children. Stop making the children responsible for how unbelievably attractive and addictive these things are. You may as well give them the keys to the liquor cabinet, stash some cocaine in there and say, don't touch. That's just not realistic. So either get on board with how they work or keep the power struggle going. But we both know the power struggle doesn't work. <sighs> so I want to recap how you can parent like the video game. And the first tip you gave was the controlled math access. That's where you're setting the boundaries. The second one is focus on the strategy, not the whole emotional piece. You're focusing right. on the strategy and you're very get, clear. Yes, get your child to focus on their strategy, right? They will fail forward. That is the strategy focus. We only learn and fail forward. We only learn by failing and we fail forward. And another tip you said was the random reward generator. Yes. And I don't know how much we talked about that this in this conversation, but that's like the loot box in the game. Yeah. And parents the, can use that strategy too, right? In oh, real life. Oh my God. Yeah. Any time that you just feel it give them a reward. Is that ice cream? Is that an extra hour of video games? Is that just to look at them and say, I love you and I believe in you and you're going to do amazing things in this world. Okay, whatever. I'm going to my room. Don't worry. They heard you text it to them. If you're worried that they didn't see it, but that releases those endorphins to say, I love you. I really love you. You're, you're amazing. I watch how successful you are at those video games, even though I'm limiting them out of my own fears and stuff like that. And I get that it pisses you off, but you're an amazing person. You figure things out. So I know you're going to be fine. Tell them, 
set them up for success. I love that. That's a, that's a random reward generator. When do you do it? Randomly. <laughs> Um, and then you also talked about the front loading. So yes. really preparing them ahead of time, making it very clear. These are, these are the rules. This is how it's going to go. Make it really clear. Um, and using words like I am willing to provide the Wi-Fi for More your video, video games, games from between. this time to this yes. time. And then just like the video game, you're letting them know if they, do chores or homework or whatever it is you decide they're going to get to increase their video yeah. game time or if they break those rules let me Lying, see if I stealing sneaking cheating or breaking the law then it goes down they're and and game. make this is the other thing this is a video game strategy sorry one more i lied i told you i was going to lie see i front loaded the fact <laughs> that i was lying video games create success in small increments and they create consequence in small increments do the same so when they do clean the bathroom and change the litter box say hey man that bathroom was a mess uh, so that's worth a half hour litter box uh that's worth another 15 like give make it incremental don't you can be on it all evening there was a the idea that I know parents, it, it's easier to just let them play. Yes. It, it's yes. easier to just, yeah. It How really many works. of us like really, really we're working from home. We've got dinner, we've got activities, we've got all the laundry, all the things. Yeah. And we can just let them play their video games and they're that out is of because, our hair. Yeah. That is because Gen Xers, and I believe you and I are Gen Xers, Laura, somehow we forgot the benefit of boredom and the discomfort that comes with boredom. God forbid I ever told my mom I was bored because she said there are hammer and nails in the garage. You know where the wood pile is. Leave me alone. Like my, my mom was extremely progressive, loving, affectionate. So was my dad, but I didn't tell him I was bored. Go pull weeds. Like, <laughs> so you watch, and I, I will tell you, parents, when we had kids come into the treatment facility, the, the video game addiction, social media addiction, tech addiction, Netflix binge out of control stuff, two weeks is how long it took them to start reading. Because we had no tech in the facility for the teenagers, none. We had a bookcase and they could talk to each other and a, a pile of art, two weeks, and they were reading. And, and I just, so the, 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 the unwillingness to let them be uncomfortable or bored, that's on you, not them. It takes two weeks to train a child to become creative. Let them be bored for two weeks and they will find something to do. Yeah. <laughs> My kids tell me they're bored. I'm like, oh, yeah. that's great. That's so good for your brain. What are you, you going to do want, about it? <laughs> do you want my ideas for boredom? Because I got some tax paperwork. We could, where did you go? Like, I. <laughs> um, okay. I just want to ask you because I, I know this is something that parents are thinking. Yeah. So, a, a lot of the strategies about how to pull your kids away from the screen, it's that front loading, it's planning yes. in advance, it's yes, coming yes. up with it a plan, letting your kids know what the boundaries are. And then when it comes time, you are empathetic. You are mirroring how they're feeling, but you're staying calm, cool, controlled. You're taking care of your needs so that you're able right. to parent from your best place. But when it comes right down to it and parents are in that heat of the moment, it's dinner time. They've told their kid to get off the video game and come to dinner and they're not coming. They're not listening. What do they do? You pull the plug and you go sit down and eat and you, the, 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 the power struggle that's coming is not worth your time. It's not worth your relationship. There is nothing in those video games that is worth your relationship with your child. There are two ways to tell them that. Hey kiddo, I know this is really tough for us right now with this video game thing. I understand it. I am not willing to allow those video games to come between us. So either you keep that from happening or I will. 
I'm open to either, but I'm going to let you try first. Now, that conversation came from a place of me being well-regulated and well-fed. And the fact that I went to the gym today, had a great night of sleep last night. The first thing I do when I get up is I drink my green and red juice and a nice big tall 16 ounce glass of water. And I take time during the day to go <sighs> on purpose. And what's amazing is that the moment I did that, about 90% of you also mimic, me. <laughs> right? And then that's, but that, but that's conscious breathing is that I'm going to take myself back first before I take my child back from the video games or from cannabis or from self-harm or from suicidality, depression, anxiety, ADHD, whatever. I'm first. I'm first. I'm first. The reason why, and I tell you this with all the love in my heart, especially to the moms who are raised much differently than the dads are raised, where the dads get to be selfish and arrogant and me, me, me. And then some guy, some white man sitting here telling you, mom, that you've got to put yourself first when your whole life you're told to help your mom and help the teacher and help the pastor and help and help and help. What I'm going to say to you is very simply this. My son and my daughter prioritize self-care because they watched my wife and I do it. It did nothing to diminish our love for them or our time with them. And in fact, even when it was to the wall, arguing and screaming and yelling in my house. And oh, yeah, moms and dads who are listening to me. I've had a parent coach for 12 years because I'm not dumb. <laughs> I can tell you all what to do with your kids, but damn it, I need someone to tell me what to do with mine because that's the world we're in. That's the life forest for the trees, peeps. This is what's going on. And when I'm with my kids, I go blind as a bat and get emotional as hell. So my coach goes, Aaron, we're not going to have this conversation. What you're going to do is you're going to up your reps in the gym. And then next week, you're going to tell your kids that in a week, you're going to have a meeting about talking about finances. And I'm like, okay, I got three weeks because none of it is life and limb. When it's suicide, when it's desperate drug use, when it's self-harm, that's life and limb. Video games are not. Stop acting like it is. Grades are not life and limb problems. There are risky choices at best. At best. But your kid is not going to die because they got a D in math because they were playing too many video games. Stop feeling like they are because it's not true. That's your own crap in the way regulate yourself. And then when you come to your kid to front load everything, it comes from a really awesome place. I'm really struggling with this video game thing, kid. I love you so much. And I have this idea of what is important in life. And these video games are so important to you that I don't understand it. So next week, I'm going to sit with you and watch you play. And I it's going to suck because I'm going to ask a ton of questions. I got to look at this pad of paper. Laura told me that I got to ask you all these weird questions and write down the answers. And so if you want to start tonight, I'm happy to. But in a couple weeks, Laura, Aaron, they've been coaching me to change some parenting around this video game thing. So I'm doing my work so I can do this better. It's probably going to affect you a little bit, but you know, I don't worry about that because this is my work. And look at what I just modeled for my kid, responsibility, making the change, improving, apologizing, taking action, make the lists, but that's what I'm modeling. And when my daughter came home from her first year away, she, she finished high school going to um, community college that had a dorm and a campus, oh, four hours away from us. And when she came home to live after she got her associate's degree, we struggled. And I went downstairs and I go, I don't know how to parent you. Now that you're 18, I'm good. I'm good with teenagers and kids, <laughs> but you're neither. You're you've become a young woman. And I don't know what to do now. And I've always had an answer. And so I feel stupid. I feel scared. And I'm really frustrated with myself. And I've been taking that out on you. And I'm so sorry, because you're amazing. 
and I love you. I don't know what I'm doing. So I got to go work with a coach. And my daughter said, dad, I have to take some responsibility for some things too. And then told me everything that she's been doing wrong. And we were okay because I modeled taking responsibility for my behavior. And when you're screaming at your child to turn off the effing, 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 effing video game, because this dinner, you worked hard on them so that they eat and are healthy, um, is appreciated. They're only focused on the effings, not the food, not your feelings. I, I mean, not, not the food, only your feelings. That's all they see. That's all they feel. And no child can handle an adult's feelings. No child can handle the adult sized feelings that comes with the fear of thinking your kid might suffer because of their risky decisions. You have to come at this from a different place. And when you do front load, give it time, set the contract in writing, put it on the fridge, have 50 copies stored in your office because they're going to tear that one up at some point, and then just put another <laughs> one up. Be willing to change the contract as you find the holes with front more front loading. Reward them. Give them clear boundaries. Make it absolutely clear how they gain privileges and earn the consequences. And by God, take care of yourself before you take care of them. Thank you. And Aaron, this contract, the, behavior, the family behavior contract, you are very generously gifting to the audience. Um, there's a link that's included so that it's on your website um, yes. and parents can access that template so that they can work on their own family behavior contract. Yes. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I'm sure um, parents are going to love to learn more from you. So where can they find you on social media? May I give you two free and one low cost one? Yes. Okay. The two free are my podcast is Beyond Risk and Back. Find it anywhere you download your favorite podcast from. Uh, I have 260 shows with the experts in child development and uh, really crisis situations. My, my niche market are the parents who are really going through uh, HE double hockey sticks with their kids. And so that's the show for them. My second uh, free support is a Facebook group called Parenting Teens That Struggle. It's on Facebook and uh, answer a few questions so I can know where you found us and uh, thank Laura for, for uh, pushing you our direction and then let you in. I moderate it. So does my daughter. So my daughter is one of the moderators there as well. Um, the low cost one is I have a parenting masterclass uh, called brabapp.com, B-R-A-B for Beyond Risk and Back. B-R-A-B-A-P-P.com. You will answer a short quiz. So I know whether to start you in the red, the yellow, or the green. Think traffic light. Full stop. Really crisis. Yellow is warning. Uh, Got to slow down. Really pay attention. And green is, you know what? Things are good. How do we make them great? It's focused on the parents. It is 56 sessions of everything I've ever taught parents. And it costs the same as a week's worth of coffee. Awesome. Yes. And this is brand new, isn't it? It is brand new. It actually just won a telly, Laura, uh, a, a telly award. So very excited about that. It's extremely high quality production. And originally it was slated like, I'm the $7.99 per core. And I was like, you know what? I want every parent to have it. So it's less than $40. Wow. Yeah. Ooh, and the last time we spoke, it wasn't out yet. So now I'm going to check it out. I'm so excited. <laughs> the brabapp.com, easy, easy test. And it also gives you a free hour with me. Um, just, wow. just to make sure that, that we get your particular situation focused and to make sure you're in the right color for what's going on in your home. Amazing. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for letting me talk about it. <laughs> Parents, let's keep this conversation going in the ADHD Village Facebook group. Under Aaron's thread, comment, what did you learn today? What will your next step be? And everybody who comments in the Facebook group will be entered to win all the summit videos access for one year, the summit action workbook, and the baddest 21-day challenge for kids. 
It really does take a village to raise a child, especially if your child has ADHD, and I am honored to be a part of your village. Thank you for spending this time with Aaron and myself. Aaron, in the village, we say, find your people and love them hard. And I'm so glad that you are one of the people in our village. Thank you, Aaron. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. I'm honored to be a part of the village, and I love that village hard. Aw, thank you. And parents, sending you all so much love. Thank you.